In 2008, the vampire subgenre was reignited in American pop culture by two hugely successful adaptations of romantic teen vampire novels. On the small screen, Alan Ball's HBO smash hit, True Blood. And on the big screen, Catherine Hardwick's juggernaut success, Twilight. But outside of the US at this time, international filmmakers were still creating darker, grittier and more innovative works of vampire fiction. Swedish director Thomas Alfredsson adapted a 2004 novel about a young boy befriending a vampire, which went on to become a huge critical success and even landed an Oscar nomination. One year later in Korea, acclaimed director Park Chan-wook adapted French novel Thérèse Racan into an erotic and visually striking vampire film, which would go on to win the jury prize at the Cannes Film Festival. Join me as we continue exploring the evolution of the vampire, and we discuss Park Chan-wook's thirst and Thomas Alfredson's Let the Right One In. Welcome back to the evolution of horror. My name is Mike Munzer, and as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres one series at a time. We are currently in the middle of our eighth series exploring the evolution of the vampire movie, and this is part 21. This week's episode is sponsored by friend of the pod, Adam Z. Robinson, and in this week's episode, as that intro suggested, we are going to be looking at two brilliant international vampire movies from the late 2000s. That's Let the Right One In and Park Chan-wook's Thirst. Loads to get through this week, so let's get straight into it. Later on in this episode, I'll be joined by Tim Coleman to discuss Park Chan-wook's Thirst in depth. But first of all, let's get into Let the Right One In. I sat down with longtime friend of the pod and host of Kavik Minderpod, Rob Watts, to discuss what I think is his favourite movie of all time. Enjoy. Are you a vampire? Had you thought of me then? Hello and welcome back, Rob Watts. Hello, Mike. How are you doing? Very good. How are you? I'm very well. Thanks for having me again. Oh, thanks for being here. I mean, as if I could have anyone else to discuss this film. <laughs> this is this is a big fave of yours, isn't it? I feel like ever since we first started doing this podcast together, like y- you have talked about this as being one of your all-time favourites, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I think in that mm. first episode, I said it was my favourite film. And just re-watching it just for this chat, just re-emphasise that completely i i adore it i love it oh i'm so excited to discuss it first of all let me just ask you your thoughts on the subgenre more broadly what, what do you think of vampire films are you do you sort of gravitate towards vampire movies generally uh no not really <laughs> um it's it's really interesting and i've listened to lots of your guests talk about kind of why why they like them and why it's kind of such a popular subgenre but mm. i don't think there's anything that really draws me into a vampire film Unless the story is unique, you know, I'm not, I don't find them super cool usually, although the, you know, the leader in 30 Days of Night is amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I guess the vampire films I enjoy are the ones that are not really about, you know, blood sucking to begin with. Yes. I always remember the first, I think the first time I ever came across a vampire was in this book that I had as a kid called Guess Who's Just Moved In Next Door which was like a picture book. And it was about like a street full of monsters and horror villains. And the hilarious joke was that the people who just moved in next door were a family of perfectly normal humans. Mm -hmm. Uh, Right. Okay. And I mean, for a, for a sort of five-year-old, this was an amazing thing. (laughs) Uh, But on the front cover was this picture of a vampire and it looked like Dracula. And that was for me, the first image I'd ever seen of a vampire. So that's what stuck in my head. Yeah. 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 But, but then really the only thing that kind of hit me vampire wise was uh was Buffy. Yes. But I was more into that for the um for Buffy, yeah. I guess, rather <laughs> rather than the vampires. Um but I'll always remember I had a dream after watching the 
pilot episode of Buffy where I got bitten in the neck and I can vividly still remember the whole the puncture marks in my neck oh my from that dream. Yeah. And it was it was terrifying. Yeah. But it was also amazingly cool. Um so I guess on some level vampires scare me. Mm, mm-hmm. uh, but that's not it they're not the they're not my favourite monster, let's put it that way. No, fair enough. Well I'm so intrigued then to find out about why this is your favourite movie. So let's talk about Let the Right One In. Obviously, we're going to talk about the original Thomas Alfredson version from 2008. Rob, set the scene for us. Give us a little plot synopsis of the film. Okay, well, I guess at the most basic level, which is how I like to read it, it's a story of friendship. Mm -hmm. But I'll give a synopsis. (laughs) Um, So a secretive young girl named Ellie moves into an apartment block in a quiet Swedish town during a dark and cold winter. She meets lonely local boy and neighbour Oscar, who's being bullied at school, and the two have formed a friendship. Elliot, turns out, is a 12-year-old vampire who has been 12 for a very long time. She lives with an old man named Haukan, who drains the blood of locals in order to feed her apparent hunger. When Haukan dies, the relationship between Ely and Oscar grows stronger, and Oscar himself becomes more confident. Ultimately, the two come to care for and depend upon each other, and it's all just beautiful. On the surface, at least. <laughs> exactly. It's uh, there's some there's some grim stuff uh, just under the surface there, isn't there? But you made it sound like yeah. such a sweet, lovely tale. <laughs> and you know what? But that's at its core, that is it, and that's what I connect to in this story. I think it's absolutely just one of the most beautiful films you know look wise and story wise it is utterly beautiful so you've already mentioned this is one of your absolute faves right tell us a little bit about your relationship and your your sort of history with this film so yeah uh, i remember going at university to see this film Mm -hmm. i think i was drawn to see it not for the vampires mostly because it looked like a beautiful swedish horror film Uh so you know i was getting this was the the time when i was really getting into kind of scandinavia and nordic stuff and and it just looked amazing. It was getting rave reviews. So I thought, right, go down. Went to the Electric Cinema in Birmingham. Mm-hmm. Went in, watched it, was blown away. Had a million questions. Wanted to see it again. And went back in the next day, watched it again. Uh, there aren't many films I've seen twice at the cinema. Mm-hmm. Probably only this and Hereditary, I think. Oh, wow. uh, but I love, and you know from you know our chats about Mulholland Drive and stuff, that I love films that are mysterious and kind of ambiguous. Yeah. And so that's what kept me going back. Like, I mean, I suppose we can touch on the book and and yeah. all the and the remake and everything. But I haven't read the book. I've not watched the, the remake. I've not seen any of the stage adaptations, and I haven't seen that new TV series that's just <laughs> no. come out. I just I want I I found this film such a perfect thing. I didn't want to know, you know, who How Can really is or yeah. what Ely what Ellie is. I just loved it so much and I've I've somehow, for the most part, managed to keep it kind of in a box itself for sort of 12 years now. Um, I love it, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, I I remember seeing it too, like very early on. I think it was at the cinema and I remember seeing the reviews. I used to read magazines like Empire and Total Film religiously back then and, and it did get sort of all these five star reviews across the board I remember and I remember reading it was a vampire horror film and I was so excited <laughs> to see it and it is just a beautiful film isn't it it is it took me by surprise when I first saw it because it wasn't really a horror film in the way that I was expecting it to be but no. it's still just a gorgeous and at times quite upsetting film I mean we'll talk about this in its in its kind of horror and it's traditional horror. But for me, some of the most horrific stuff that I can watch in films is sort of bullying and sadism yeah. and that kind of thing. And some of the stuff that you get in this film is so dark and so upsetting, isn't it? That's the thing. That's it. It's, it is a horror film. Mm. Whether it was designed as a horror film or not, it, it, pays, it, it owes a debt to all kind of horror. Yeah. But at, at its core, I guess it's a kind of realistic drama that has these supernatural elements. And a lot of that realism is what is is the stuff that's, you know, scarier mm-hmm. because humans are horrible, aren't we? Yeah, that's it. It's humans <laughs> that are the awful ones, as always in monster movies. It's so true. Uh, let's talk, first of all, about the, the direction in general then. Thomas Alfredson, right? Uh, what do you think of... You know, what is it about the way that he kind of brings this story to life on screen, do you think, that makes it work so well? I think it's just 
it's a very still, mm. calm film it to is. watch. It's very quiet, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it? So quiet, so dark. And a lot of that is because of the setting. You know, we're up in sort of just north of Stockholm. So it's very cold. It's very dark. Yeah. It's, to our, to non-Swedes anyway, I guess, quite alien as a as a place, especially a setting for a for a vampire film. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, Alfredson just lets stuff play out. It's kind of eerie with the snow falling. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, I just, I think it's, it's not over directed, you know? No, it's not that flashy, is it? Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of that is to do with um, Hoyter van Hoytema's cinematography as well. He keeps a lot of it in one sort of long tracking shot. So we get to meet Oscar and Ellie in one of these tracking shots outside mm. the kind of 70s style buildings you know it's all this the setting is is kind of the main thing here it's it's kind of stark it's not interesting no really. no um, and somehow thomas alfredson makes things interesting just letting you look at every kind of corner of the frame and all the detail because it's so unknown um and you've got the contrast of the sort of block buildings and the forest Mm-hmm. which is obviously not that far away either. Mm. But you get the tracking shots through the forest as well and all the, the lines of trees. And yeah, yeah. I think it's just a beautifully composed film. Yeah, so still and muted. And he's good at mm. that, isn't he? The, you know, obviously a couple of years later, Alfredson did Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, didn't he? Which yeah. was, again, this kind of quite grim looking, like kind of, <laughs> you know, like sort of drab 70s buildings. And it was quite quiet and unassuming, but sort of tense at the same time. And you can see why he ended up getting the gig to do that movie off the back of this one in a way, right? For sure. Although I'd probably say... I think he maybe took it a little bit too far in Tinker Tailor. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a It's slog. quite boring. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I thought we're, we're not really allowed to say that because people love that film, don't they? But I, yeah, I agree I, with you. I found it hard work. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's good. It's a great story, but it is a very slow film. That Really, yeah. really slow. Whereas this movie um, doesn't actually ever feel slow. Like it's, it's, no. it's, it is very slow paced in a way and it's muted and it's quiet and it's still, but that just works for this particular story, doesn't it, I think? Yeah, and it is punctuated by these moments of proper horror, yes. of of vampire attacks, of cats going crazy, or mm-hmm. all that kind of thing, of blood dripping. and Yeah, it's actually more reminiscent, because, you know, this, and we've discussed this loads together, but this, this came out in a time when horror was quite hardcore, quite violent, particularly Western mm. horror, right? You know, Saw movies and French extremity, and, you know, this came out the same year as Martyrs and all that kind of stuff. But actually, <laughs> in a way, Let the Right One In does feel more akin to maybe stuff like hereditary or the sorts of movies that we've been getting in the last few years the witch and stuff these kind of like slow quiet character dramas almost with these like bursts of horror um that that make it all the more impactful i think you know yeah and get you inside the mind of those characters whether they're supernatural or or what have you 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 really get a feel for for them for the characters themselves like yes the setting is a big character in this film Mm. And rightly so. It's so dark and that's perfect for a vampire film, of course. Um, but it, it does allow us to get to know our main vampire, Ellie, and yeah, and her relationship with Oscar. And obviously you discuss Icelandic cinema on your own podcast and we've talked mm. about Nordic cinema together before on Patreon. But would you say this is you kind of, is this quite typical of what we'd expect of kind of Nordic horror and Nordic cinema? Well, Nordic horror is so small. Yeah. As <laughs> yeah. I try, tried desperately digging to find more and more, and there's just not that much. Yeah. Um, so, especially if we were to, to talk specifically about a Swedish vampire film, I'm not sure there are any. No, that's interesting. If, if at least before this. Yeah. So typical, I don't know, but maybe as a typical kind of setting for a Swedish realist film, mm, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, in the Nordic regions, it's dark and it's cold and it's snowy so you do get a lot of that kind of landscape but often it is out in the countryside Mm -hmm. especially Icelandic cinema you know you've got lots and lots of mountains and glaciers and all of that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. Um, farms and the snow settling and here we've got snow everywhere not causing a problem to anyone it's just a part of everyday life uh, which is 
I guess what makes it such good cover for a vampire yeah. uh, in this film. But yeah, I guess it's typical in that it's, it is quite calm and it does genuinely give you that feeling of being there. It's cold. It it's feels cold, cold and dark. Yeah, you're so right. And and I was thinking this when watching it again today. Like, do you think there's a specific narrative reason for why it's set in? It's like 1981, right, or early 80s. Early um, 80s. Yeah. Like, would this have been? A, I, I I was just thinking, could they have potentially set this in 2008, and would it have made much of a difference? You know, that's a really interesting question. Um, I I don't know. I guess. It's technology, isn't it? Usually, yeah. it's the, the thing that's going to mess these. Well, that's what I thought, and I thought maybe it's it's it adds to that feeling of isolation that mm-hmm. you know Oscar isn't necessarily able to use a mobile phone or to easily get away or get help or whatever. There's probably that element, and and also like there's something about bullying that makes me feel like that was. I mean, of course, bullying is still a thing in schools, but that kind of extreme bullying that sort of went unnoticed in schools. I kind of feel like maybe that's a, a little bit more of its time. I don't know, but but yeah. perhaps yeah. I get. I guess just the the kind of role of children in the family and yes. the way that that kids were looked after. I think, especially in this film, anyway, Oscar's parents have separated and they don't seem to keep many tabs on him no or, that's so true care. that's another real thing about 80s movies is that kids were just left to their own devices <laughs> right like parents didn't uh factor into it most of the time yeah no that's very much kind of spielberg's thing isn't yeah, it? yeah 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 um, yeah but um you're right i guess he could have made friends online if it was set mm. these days and he'd be rather than sticking in his uh newspapers cuttings into a scrapbook he'd be surfing the internet and mm-hmm. looking at vampire law in that way I don't know whereas here he's kind of like he's got no he's just got no access to anything no so yeah so he's excluded he's cut off which is probably why Ellie moves to that area because it is kind of such an isolated place she can hide and not be noticed whereas for him being unnoticed is uh is not such a good thing no absolutely let's talk about these characters then so Oscar what a sad and sweet child, right? And like, oh. But also, a little bit of a weirdo. I mean, like, when we first introduced... Literally, our introduction to him, right, is when he's saying squeal and he is stabbing at a mm. tree with a knife, right? It feels very deliberate that, that that's how we're introduced to this child, right? But, but what do you make of Oscar as our protagonist? Yeah, and that's an interesting uh, opening to his character, isn't it? I guess it's a little yeah. bit Travis Bickle, but... Uh, I think really he's kind of just acting out a fantasy that he would never be able to do in real life. He's, I mean, to some degree, he's me uh, as a kid. I, you know, we've, we, um, certainly I felt a little bit lonely. Mm-hmm. He had a little bit of bullying going on as a kid, but he's, I think he's just very relatable as in everyone's experienced a bit of bullying, like you said. Yeah. Um, he's, he's from a broken home, gets ignored. And he's, he's very introverted. Yes. He doesn't seem to have any friends. Um, and he's desperate for some thing to happen, some kind of connection. And I think he's just ultimately really empathetic, mm. um, regardless of whether you think he's going to use that knife for any yeah. real purpose. Uh, I think he's just a bit... Yeah, so he's, he's a sad character. He is. And... The whole, I think the film really shows beautifully how, you know, someone on the outside can benefit from just the slightest of connection. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I guess I guess that's the other thing that that first moment we meet him is emphasizing is just how lonely he is. He's 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 imagining conversations and interactions with people on his own, right? In this very desolate dark world that he lives in. Yeah. Yeah, he 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 wants to stand up for himself. Mm-hmm. And you want him to stand up for himself as yeah. you as we see what ha- what's happening in his life. And mm-hmm. uh, you you want him to come out of his shell, but you know, for that opening period, it's clear that he's just on his own 
and that's not going to happen, is it? And yeah, and then sad. and then we meet, of course, Ellie, um, mm. who what? And again, a really fascinating kind of quite mysterious character, really. And I'm like you, I haven't read the book, I haven't seen the TV show, I don't know. There's probably more <laughs> information about her as a character, right? But uh, yeah, quite a mystery. What, what do you think of Ellie in this film? Uh, again, beautiful. Yeah, absolutely beautiful character. Really, really well drawn. She's. Like I said, she's a 12-year-old vampire. Mm. Uh, she's a reluctant vampire. Mm-hmm. She doesn't want to go around killing people, though she knows she has to. But crucially, it's this 12-year-old thing, you know. For some reason, she was turned at 12, yeah. which is, on, in its own way, just incredibly horrific yes. and sad. Um, and she just wants someone to talk to of of a similar mindset of a similar age Mm -hmm. and you can see the second that she meets oscar that's someone that she can be with and Mm. and feel herself around or feel her previous self around yeah yeah because there is something very interesting about this is like a, a really interesting trope i find we talked about this briefly with near dark and with kirsten dunst an interview with the vampire this idea of a child who is may actually be hundreds of years old for all we know, mm. right? Who actually does have maybe age and experience, but is trapped physically in the body of a child. And Ellie has that. Like there is a kind of slight more maturity about her, isn't there, compared to Oscar? Um, but also there are moments when she does just seem like a very innocent child at the same time, you know? Yeah, and that's kind of the the really interesting thing about her character. Because in my mind, it's like, okay, well, she's a 12-year-old, but she's lived for however many years, so she has that experience. But yeah. is her mind still that of a 12-year-old? Because, yeah. you know, I mean, I don't know how much this has been explored in the series so far, but do vampires' brains Age. grow? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, so has she developed the brain of an adult? Or is she still a, a child learning about life in that way every day? Um, which would mean, you know, every time she comes across a new game or child or or what have you that that's all she really wants Mm -hmm. well there is this obviously this relationship that she has with Hakan this guy who is Mm. almost like her sort of familiar like almost like a sort of assistant type character slash a sort of father figure slash maybe more right in the book Mm. I've read um I've read that in the book it delves into that history of that relationship more and there is actually a kind of paedophilic relationship almost going on there um which the film doesn't really dwell on but um they have a kind of again a very ambiguous strange relationship don't they they do yeah and when you say it doesn't really get touched on that the paedophilia thing Mm. i i don't see it in this film at all no i see him i see hakan as yeah i mean this is this is one of those things about the ambiguity of the film that i love it's like is he um is he just a random that she's got off the street to help her is he oscar from yeah. 60 years ago yeah. is he you know I'm, I'm reluctant to say her father but you know there's a whole bunch of re- of things that he could be mm-hmm. um and i'm glad that we don't know for sure but what we do know is that he cares a lot yes. for her and he's willing to potentially get caught. He's willing to sacrifice himself for her mm-hmm. to keep her living. Um, and I'm glad that it's not because, that in, in the film, that it's not because he wants yeah. anything untoward. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, if anything, he seems... <laughs> yeah, he sort of... He cares about her, but also he's deeply unhappy, right? He, he almost mm. feels like the victim in that he is kind of trapped with this vampire living a life of like god knows how many years he's been doing this i i always yeah. read it like you said as that he was once oscar you know that maybe this is something she's done many many times over she's made friends with boys her own age befriended them and then they stay with her for life basically until they get too old for it and she finds somebody else and that's sort yeah. of what yeah. happens in this film isn't it And we end up with oscar going on a train with her at the end, he, he's basically become the next Hakan, hasn't he? You know? Well, this is the thing about it. It's like, it's about the ending specifically. Mm. It's so beautiful. I keep using that word. I should come up with another word. <laughs> it here. is though, uh, yeah. That they that they f- f- establish this kind of love and friendship. Mm-hmm. But there's this undercurrent of, oh yeah, but 
if if Ellie really does want to survive, she just needs someone. Um, so how much of this friendship is her planning her next move, planning mm-hmm. the next hundred years of her life? I I I never follow that line. I <laughs> yeah. never want to think about it like that. Yeah. Uh, but it is very true. You know, she's lonely. Oscar's lonely. How can it, just as lonely? Really? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's all very uh, yeah. Yeah. And I think I think you're right. And both of those things can be true. I think she probably does need him in a pragmatic way, and maybe he sort of needs her in a pragmatic way too. Like she's she's going to protect him from now on, right? And she's going to be the company and the friend that he needs as well as a kind of probably almost parent figure or protector as well, you know? So, like, they sort of need each other um, as yeah, well as in- just needing that kind of sort of emotional connection. Yeah. Yeah, and you use the word protection. And obviously in the film, the protector is Ellie. Yeah. Really. She's the one telling Oscar to defend himself. And yeah. ultimately she does it for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you're right, like, taking her in the box and then looking after her potentially mm. finding her victims uh is a is i guess a form of protection as well although you know is he re- i know we're talking about the ending but is he really ready to I know. drain people's blood i know or just to go <laughs> off by and be independent all of a sudden it's like wow but uh, yeah again i mean that's another interesting thing that is sort of very lightly touched upon right is his relationship with his parents or just his home life like it's mm. again it seems very lonely it sort of seems like i don't know he does have a good relationship with his mom right but it also she seems quite absent most of the time yeah i mean i guess that's the thing with um parents who've split yeah she's spending most of her time working Mm -hmm. she doesn't have much time to spend with him and when she does he's just whipped some kid around the ear with a pole so her the only time she gets with him is being super angry Mm -hmm. um but that yeah that thing of even the way that she's shot for most of the film especially the first half you don't see her head yeah you just you see oscar and then you know as if she's not really she doesn't really figure in this Mm -hmm, equation mm -hmm. uh, which which ultimately she doesn't uh and his dad lives god knows how far away in the middle of nowhere like he's chosen some sort of isolation yeah god Uh, yeah and actually thinking about it there is a kind of spielbergy connection there you know like that there's almost something kind of et about it but more fucked up (laughs) right but this i because one of the one of the uh choices that spielberg made when he made et was that he always kept the camera very very low it's always at child height so sometimes parents heads are off screen and that kind of thing and you're right there is an element of that to this as well and and this idea of this lonely boy with separated parents making friends with this uh, non-human thing i suppose you know and there is something to that there's no at no point do they even know no or comment on the fact that he's made a friend no like that would normally be a source of kind of joy mm-hmm. or it would be a positive thing that he's made a friend and that that's what he's spending his time doing but they don't even well, his mum doesn't even comment or no. even, yeah, seem to know. Um, let's talk about the actual vampirism that we get here in this film as well then. Obviously, mm. so many different types of film, uh, so many filmmakers, you know, show us different types of vampirism, <laughs> pick and choose their own vampire rules. Would you say that this kind of vampire that we get on screen is is, is quite traditional or, or is it kind of doing its own thing with the vampire lore? Uh, from my experience of vampires, there's... A lot of typical vampire lore in yeah. here. Yeah. Um, I mean, we could, I could go through an, a nice mm. little list if you fancy. Do it. Do it. Let's. Well, we can start with the title, for instance. You know, let the right one in. Lot de reta coma in. The vampire thing of you know being invited in yes. to someone's house. It's actually one of the best ever sequences of showing what happens if you don't invite a vampire into a house. Right. It's a very yeah. sad and and disturbing moment that moment when she oh. walks in without being invited it's wonderful isn't it yeah it's it's one of the it's, it's obviously it's the it's the one i've got in a picture above my bed yeah and is on screen here in my, in the zoom um it's it's just so amazingly done yeah. you know they by this point in the film um we've established that oscar and e- ellie are friends mm-hmm. she has done a couple of things to gain his trust to prove that she 
is his friend and she's not going to eat him. Yes. <laughs> uh, such as eating the food, which is another kind of vampire thing. They can't eat human food. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and she is immediately sick when she does that. Yes. But this is the ultimate. She's crossing the threshold to, to show Oscar exactly what she is. Mm-hmm. And it's in that moment at the doorway as the blood starts pooling from her ears and yeah. cracking through her scalp. And mm-hmm. it's just an, a masterfully done moment, yeah. I think. Yeah, I completely agree. And uh, I think, and what's brilliant, again, it's got, I don't know whether c- this movie, do they ever actually even say the word vampire? Do they mention vampires? There's, there's one moment just after this. Right, yeah. Where, so she comes through the door and then she closes another door into her apartment. Mm-hmm. And he says, he just comes right, Oscar comes right out and says it, says, are you a vampire? Right, that's right. Yes, yes, yes. And she basically says yes. Uh, but that is the only mention of it. Yeah, and and, and that, you know, obviously we see her killing people um, from pretty early on in the film. But, but like, you know, there is this thing with vampires more than any other subgenre, I think, where they assume we know the drill, right? I mean, you don't, you know, you can go into this not knowing it's a vampire film, but you will get that she is a vampire probably by about 30 minutes in, I should think. And that's because it does, it is fairly traditional in a lot of regards, I think. Yeah, yeah she's she needs to feed on blood. Mm-hmm. We never we never do see her teeth though. No, there's no fangs, right? That's no interesting. Fangs. Yeah. Apparently the actress Lena Lee Anderson had some tiny little fangs put in, but I think the idea was that we don't need to show no. that... Um, and in, in many ways, I find it more horrific to see her just going for it and come up looking totally yeah, human. Yeah, agreed. The blood dripping from a normal mouth rather than the fangs out and the, the you know, cross yes, forehead. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you don't need any of that in, in this at all. But I do like the sort of the eyes the eyes are, are Ooh, weird yeah. right and there there are little subtle things about her appearance that that make her look slightly otherworldly like the eyes that's it and that comes back to the way alfredson shoots the film we see a lot of close-ups especially mm-hmm. between ellie and oscar mm. uh, we see them close together in close-up shots but we also see loads and loads of eyes and mouths yeah. and, and ellie's eyes especially are just so are they like crescents i think yeah if you look closely it's just Yeah, she's got magnetic eyes, something supernatural going on, uh, which I think Oscar notices early on. And these moments when she does attack people, like under the bridge or later on in the bath in the bathroom, it it's amazing when you suddenly see that transformation from this sweet little child to this sort of like feral animal almost. Right when she feeds, it's very cool. Oh my god! Yeah, that scene in the bathtub. Mm. She's lying there, cute as can be yeah slumbering and then within a second she's on the guy's back draining him of blood just like bam yeah wow yeah it's really and then and again like you said like these moments of horror do pack a punch i think when you get them and those moments of hakan you know attacking people at the beginning or sort of hanging them upside down and draining them of their blood and stuff oh, you know it's great that scene it? is is just perfect you know it's it's a great way of establishing so many things in the film. Mm-hmm. You know, we're in this relatively quiet, dark neighborhood, but you can see cars going along in the background. He's for some reason Hack has not gone that far away to do this. He's quite inept. <laughs> he is really. actually I'm surprised yeah. he's got that far. Maybe it's just old age. I'm not sure. But uh, that seems brilliant because you get the. You get, you understand what Hakan's doing, who, mm-hmm. what his role is. You see where they are, and you see his character of, you know, he's not so good at, at what he's doing. But you also see how close they are to reality, and the the poodle comes strolling along in quite yeah. a comical scene, uh, and he just, yeah, he runs, doesn't he? And the blood against the the snow. It's all very graphic and amazing. Yes, because there is this other element to this film that I sort of always forget about, which is all of the neighbours and the and the, the the adults in you know mm. in this neighbourhood that obviously start to realise what's going on or start to be affected by it. So of course we get like our first victim, and then people are wondering what's happened. There's that guy with all the cats that sort of witnessed it, right? And then there's that woman that gets bitten. She starts to change, and then she gets mm-hmm. attacked by the cats. Like, what do you think of all of that? stuff that kind of slight b plot i suppose to this movie yeah I, I'm, I can't remember it probably wasn't you but someone recently asked me what the point of all of those characters was mm. and i'd forgotten that question until i watched it recently and i guess the main 
point is just to show that we are in a real place. Yeah. Um, and there are groups of people just living their lives in this quiet corner of the world. Um, and these people are normal. And, you know, Ellie needs someone to eat. So she we've does. got to have some food. Yeah, there's almost like around. a there's almost like a little body count element to to, to this, isn't there? But but also the what what I thought as well watching it is that you need that to have the reason for why Ellie maybe needs to keep skipping town and moving as well, because eventually the locals start to notice and they will <laughs> and they will come for her, right? And people were coming for her. So there is there's, they almost function as that kind of angry mob in Frankenstein or something, you know, this like group of locals that are going to come for the monster until she moves on to the next town kind of thing. That's you know? true. Uh, yeah. Except for a long, long time, they've got absolutely no idea what's going on. No. <laughs> uh, although even the police, the police are just not in this film. No. Except for giving like drug talks and things at the school. That's right. Yeah. But it's, I think it's fascinating that, yeah, Ellie's able to just get on with stuff. Hakan gets kind of caught, but mm. that's sort of the end of his story. No one ever goes to his apartment until the end when, like you say, as it Lackey goes to, to confront Ellie. Um, because, of course, he has, he did finally see her. That attack on Virginia is is superb. We it's It's one of those moments where we finally see that Ellie is supernatural, the way she kind of scurries up the tree. Yes. You know, ju- and that shot of her jumping from above onto Virginia's back, beautifully shot uh, and really surprising. Uh, and yeah, and so she give, kind of gives the game away there she where does. she gets caught essentially. And that's uh, and, and that's our first bit of kind of, you know, classic vampire lore too in that that at that point virginia starts to change right because she, she survives yeah. that attack but then the next morning she gets burnt in daylight etc and uh yeah she starts to transform basically yeah it's really cool because this is a film where it's a vampire film yes mm. and it is particularly a singular vampire film yes there aren't any other vampires mm-hmm. we 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 don't know anything about what the status of vampires in Sweden is. We don't know whether Ellie knows of any other vampires. We don't know anything. We don't see anything. So this reaction, this change in Virginia is all we really get to know about what happens when a vampire does its thing. And boy, is it exciting to watch. Yeah. (laughs) I I love that moment. She's lying in bed and she just gets a little singe on her finger. Mm -hmm. And she's like, oh, okay. And then you can almost feel her blood boiling um, and itching as she opens that blind. Um, Yes, it's true. It's visceral, isn't it? Yeah. It really is. And the sound design is incredible there. Like she's almost hearing better than she ever could but it's overwhelming Mm -hmm. um and it all boils up to that moment where she's like i just can't handle whatever is going on yeah um and yeah she bursts into flames burns herself up in the sun yeah that's an amazing moment as well Um, isn't it now the one moment that a lot of people are less thrilled about is the cgi cat attack right well what do you (laughs) what do you and that scene was cut from the remake the remake which in many ways is very very faithful to the point where it's utterly pointless because it's basically oh, the same okay. film but in the english language um but that cat scene is removed funnily enough but but what Shocking. do you think of that cat scene in this <clears throat> um yeah i i mean it's hard not to agree with people who say it looks a bit shonky yeah uh i would say i would agree yeah. it's it's not brilliant mm. and to a certain extent i'm not even sure what its function is I, maybe you can tell me, do cats and vampires have a long-standing <laughs> hatred of each other? Not that I'm really aware of. <laughs> I mean, I guess cats in films in general uh, can almost work as kind of portents or omens. You know, if a cat is hissing at something, it usually means it's a wrong or a baddie, right? Sure. So I guess it's yeah. a sign that she's sort of transforming into a monster there. Um, okay. Yeah. And you know, in in theory, it's a it's a good creepy moment. I think it's just sadly, it's just that we were still in mid two thousands CGI territory, weren't we? At this point, you know. Yeah, I think you, I've I've heard the director talk about you know it's quite hard to wrangle cats. Yes, um, yes. So CGI, I guess, was the only way to do it. But yeah, it it doesn't look great. Uh, you get you get the sense of oh shit, something's wrong. This is mm. horrible for Virginia. Mm-hmm. 
but I think probably the same we could have got the same effect from a similar moment to earlier on when the cat at the the stand hisses at Ellie we could probably have done with something very just similar to that yes got the same effect you know even if it was to the point of a cat had hissed at her and she fell down the stairs yeah I don't know exactly um, yeah I yeah. understand why it's there but it's not don't think it's 100% necessary no, uh, no. and without it I would still I'd probably I'd, I'd love the film just as much but I don't hate the film any less for including it no I agree um so let's talk about like what I think is some of the most upsetting horror in this film which is the other stuff which is the oh, stuff to God. do with the bullies um what do you think of it's Connie isn't it who's like the sort yeah. of lead bully who again like it's quite subtle but you do get a, a, a hint of more than just a kind of two-dimensional sort of bad kid in this movie, don't you? But what do you make of him um, in this movie? Well, yeah, it's kind of that classic school bully. He's got his little gang. He's trying to show off to be the the, the coolest, the strongest, you know, the, mm. the, the one in charge. And he's got his minions doing his bidding. Uh, and he's a little twerp. You know, he's not he's, particularly he's tiny, menacing. He's tiny, isn't he? Yeah, he's, yeah. He's tiny. He's kind of... He's sort of elfin. He's kind of a, a cute little kid. Yeah. But yeah. with a creepy, creepy little eye. He's not um, like he's not like the bullies in a sort of Stephen King, like, Stand By Me type movie that are really big and have flick knives. Like, he's just, an, he's just another little child, basically, isn't he? You know? Yeah, another little, slightly more menacing child yeah. who's attacking a character who... I mean, he doesn't do doesn't help himself, Oscar. You know, no. wide eyed and gormless half the time. <laughs> you know, yeah. he's an easy prey for yeah. someone who wants to show off. And Connie, I guess, has seized that opportunity. And he's sort of the only one who revels in the bullying. His little cronies just they don't they seem quite reluctant as well. Like, yeah, as, you know, Ellie's a reluctant vampire. These guys are reluctant bullies. Mm-hmm. Um, it's only when the one, the blonde one, especially Andreas, when he's whipping, he's so s- sort of upset at doing it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then he really gets into it. You kind of think, oh, he's getting some kind of catharsis from this. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of one motivation. But then Connie's motivation is, I guess, kind of alluded to in that he's got a bullying older brother. <laughs> yeah. The, it's the classic bully thing in that he himself is probably a victim of bullying right and Mm. then it's taking it out on someone even sort of more passive than he is i suppose yeah exactly there's there's no parents there either yeah they're they they're oblivious to what's going on in their own home and jimmy's just being a knob to his younger brother Mm -hmm. but then you know sort of stands up for him later on yes but they're all just a bunch of bored one assumes kids looking for a bit of fun and oscar is the uh is the the prey here and it's such an awful thing isn't it because you're like yes stand up for yourself but then the second he does and he and he you know he whips um connie in around the ear and you just think oh fuck that's even things are going to be even worse for oscar now that he's stood up for himself and done that Mm -hmm. right that's the thing and it's like that's the horrible thing about those kind of bullying situations is that there's essentially no way out of it is there that's the thing oh no and Ellie's constantly saying, stand up for yourself, stand up for yourself. And everyone Mm. kind of, when it comes to bullying, you either don't do something or you do do something. Yeah. And if you don't do something, generally it's not going to stop. But by doing something, you put yourself in a dangerous position. In serious danger, yeah. Especially because Oscar does it in full view of the teachers and all of that. Uh, But those two moments of bullying, of, of... injury mm. are, are some of the standout moments especially kind of with regards to sound design and stuff you know when is it martin the slightly taller bully yeah he whips oscar around the face oh and it, it stings and you can feel that sting yeah the sound design kind of cuts away and it kind of you just get the reverberation of it of it kind of whipping across his face and you just oh i can feel the cold and the numbing of the cheek and then that's even kind of amplified in connie's situation where it's basically his entire ear gets kind of oh obliterated yeah uh and you know in my mind you know when the teacher comes over to to kind of blot the blood yeah can you imagine the feel of a freezing cold 
cut bloody ear with that on top of it. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't bear thinking about. Yeah, it's gross, <laughs> isn't it? Absolutely gross. Yeah, those moments are so shocking and visceral. I think you're seeing, you know, such such gruesome violence on children in this movie as well oh. in such a, a brutal way, you know? It, it is That, for me, is, like I say, the most upsetting stuff, way more than the vampire stuff, you know? Yeah, and this is all stuff that we'd see in non-horror films, you know? This is a kind of coming-of-age film to a certain degree. It is, yeah. And we see that in, you know, teen films all the time. And we're constantly cringing and mm-hmm. and upset at the scenes in that. And it's it's really interesting to see them transplanted into a into a horror film and make just as much of an impact as a vampire draining someone's life away. The other interesting thing about this as well, um, is whether or not there is a sort of queer element Mm. almost to it, right? You know, and again, this has been talked about a lot in the vampire subgenre with most films. In the novel, Ellie apparently is is referenced as an androgynous boy who was castrated Mm. um, centuries ago. And, you know, again, that's not really touched upon in this movie, although there is a really brief moment, right, when she's naked and you see a scar down yes. there right and uh, there's lines that she says to oscar like i'm not a girl now obviously she could be talking about how the fact that she's a woman of like hundreds of years old actually <laughs> and she, or that she's a vampire but yeah. there is also this ambiguity that is she a boy or is she almost sort of non-gender you know i don't mm-hmm. know but and, and 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 then also there are there are potential I don't know, hints at sort of Oscar's sexuality in that regard as well, maybe. And maybe that's part of the reason why he's being bullied or something. We don't really know, but I think all of that is kind of potentially in there as well, isn't it? I think so. I think it's, it's difficult, isn't it? Because most people watching the film bring the novel into it. And as I say, I haven't read the novel. I know about some of this stuff. I've tried to avoid it. Yeah. But yeah, what, like... That moment of the scar mm. is so fleeting and it it kind of coming out of that first screening, it felt almost like a dream. Like, did I even yes. see that? It's so quick. And yeah. It's there for such a short space of time to make you think, you know, there are any, there's any number of reasons there could be a scar there. You know, it may be that's just what happens when a person becomes a vampire in Swedish vampire law. Yeah. I don't know. But yes, this... This idea that it's a love story, whether or not Ellie is a boy or a girl, mm. um, I think is what the film is about. It's a, But it's about a, like a pre-sexual love. He's only 12. I, I don't think that he knows his sexuality at this point. I don't think he knows. I don't think he's really thinking about mm. Ellie in that way. Um and even down to the, the the beautiful scene where she climbs in his window, mm. undresses and climes into bed. He, he's not he's not bothered about her her gender or her sexuality. No, he just wants someone to be friends with. Yeah, someone is paid attention to him. He's made a connection with, and he's happy mm-hmm. that they're friends. Yes, I think that's that's the way I re- always read it. Um, whether or not. We read Ellie as a as a male, a female, a boy, a girl, what what have you. Mm. Um, I think it's still a beautiful relationship story about pre yeah pre sexual yeah love. absolutely and it is that it is that and yeah and I and I agree I agree with you and I think I think it's all really interesting that it's all in there very very subtly mm. for you to think about and notice or not basically right yeah and that, that's you what's can so read wonderful about you this like film into it yeah. yeah. Yeah, Um, because it's so simple, but there is also a lot of texture there as well, which is really nice. Um, So there you go. I want to finish by asking you about the final sequence as well, when all of these kind of like things converge, essentially, right? (laughs) This this relationship with Ellie, this vampire, this horrible bullying situation. And it all comes to like this breathtaking final scene, doesn't it? In the swimming pool, which is again, like what a... What a stunning sequence that is. Again, really upsetting, really disturbing, but also kind of beautiful, right? It doesn't get any less shocking either. No. Um, I, I've i spoken to so many people about this and every time someone watches it for the first time, the first thing they'll say is, oh my God, <laughs> that swimming pool scene. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's so well done, mm-hmm. you know? It, it builds and builds. It starts, it feels, I mean, going back to the very beginning of that scene, it... 
you're you're at a swimming pool after school. It just yeah. feels like a classic going for your swimming lesson. There's people bombing into the pool. Yeah. You know, splashing. Classic sounds of a swimming pool. Uh, Oscar's doing his weird little exercise thing, which yes. <laughs> we haven't spoken about his gym teacher, who's probably the funniest thing in this film. Yes, that's true. Um, yeah. He's a yeah. very strange man. Uh but I love that you've got this weird pop song playing on the radio and it's echoing in that kind of weird way that mm. swimming pools do, mm-hmm. creating this weird kind of off, something kind of off about the yeah, scene. Yeah, there is. The bullies come marching in, kick the, the radio into the water and everything's just silent, isn't it? Uh, and the tracking shot ends when Jimmy is in front of, of Oscar and it's just so brilliantly put together. Jimmy just, you know, he give, gives Oscar the uh, the three minutes to not breathe, essentially. Yeah. Um, and Oscar basically surrenders to his fate. But uh, What a but, yeah, horrible, the- horrible situation that is when he's like, you've got to stay underwater for three minutes or else I'm taking your eye out, basically. It's like, yeah. it's just horrific, like, isn't it? And you even, we don't know if that's going to happen. Like, no. is someone like Jimmy capable of that? Mm. They've all got knives. I... I I know, don't know, maybe that's just yeah. a Swedish thing, an 80s thing. I, <laughs> I think know, it's but... an 80s thing. Everyone had bloody <laughs> knives in the 80s, it seems like, all teenagers, okay. you know, and they all seem to be capable of actual homicide in the 80s as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, God. Well, thankfully, that's not what we get. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah, it's just brilliant, isn't it? You know, we're in this moment of utter brutality against human on human, and it's so quiet and Oscar's under the water. This is amazing. And whether it's because of money constraints or what, whatever the reason, mm. just knowing what's happening off screen yeah. is, it just lets your mind go crazy. Yeah. You know, we see feet dragged through yeah. the water. We see a head lopped off, an yeah. arm comes off. It's brutal in the most kind of subtle way, almost. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know. You hear Ellie smash through the windows and you're like oh shit yeah something's going on and yeah it's utterly utter carnage it's very sati- it's very satisfying isn't it i think you know because you're just it like is. thank god thank god oscar's been saved you know and yeah i love the way it's filmed just focusing on his little face and then just seeing all oh, of these like little face. these little severed limbs just drop into the water you know like a <laughs> head and then the arm and everything it's just it's great what a great way of 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 staging that sequence you know yeah it's just and because oscar we throughout the film we just want oscar to stand up for himself and when he does it doesn't go to plan so at this point it's hard to know what he's thinking other than i'm probably just gonna die here because he's seen ellie what who he thinks has gone away in a taxi her flat's completely empty yeah uh and he's just there surrendering to it and then in the, in the kind of classic way, he the whole scene is could be an absolute blood fest, gore fest. Mm-hmm. It could be limbs flying everywhere. We could see everything, but we don't. And as he resurfaces, he doesn't even take a deep breath. He kind of just relaxes into the moment as his vampire, his monster, comes to save yeah. him. It's just amazing. It's great, isn't it? And then I notice when they when we get the wide shot then of the kind of the aftermath of the carnage, one of those bullies was left alive, right? The blonde one, the sort of yeah, blonde Andreas. reluctant one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's I think that's really an interesting choice because Ellie has obviously not killed him for sympathetic reasons maybe. Yeah. We don't know how much she's been watching them. We know that it has that she has been watching. because mm-hmm. um, there's that brilliant moment where she's wearing uh, a woolly hat and a coat like trying to blend That's in right, yeah. even though we know she doesn't feel the cold yeah yeah, um, yeah but he's left there and you just think is is anyone going to believe him about what he saw mm-hmm. is does is he did he ever did he even see what was going on because he had his head in his hands it's a great it's a great way to end it just like the aftermath of three broken bodies and then him yeah. just crying just sobbing in the corner i know it's great and then of course naturally for that reason they have to skip town right and that's sort of it then then we've already talked about it but but that final shot of them on the train together uh kind of creepy but sort of hopeful at the same time right that moment when they're knocking on the and we haven't even talked about that how they talk in sort of morse code through the wall and everything don't they but they they're doing that at the very end there when she's in the suitcase and it's there's something kind of sweet about it well the whole film 
like in your notes you say melancholy yeah and it the whole thing is completely melancholic sort of kind of sad um and johann soderquist's score really kind of emphasizes that all the way through and using the same motif at the end somehow it's like mm. oh no but but it is hopeful <laughs> yes they've they've severed their ties Oscar's left his mum and dad like he's found his friend this is what he wants to do he wants to go off into the world with his one and only friend Ellie's now got her companion and away they go and it's like I'm always left thinking this is this is a good thing yeah right yeah I think it, I choose to think it is I think I think Oscar's gonna have a lovely a lovely life with with Ellie yeah and hopefully you, won't end up like poor Hacken you know uh, at his wits end pouring acid on his own face by the end of his oh, life fingers crossed yeah <laughs> I wonder whether um Jan I- Ivada Lindqvist would do a a sequel novel I mean mm-hmm. I don't know how the novel ends but it would be quite interesting to see this couple years and years later yeah I think I wouldn't normally want a sequel of any kind, but no. that relationship's so special. I I would be kind of interested to see that. And there's no suggestion that she's even thought about turning him into a vampire too, right? Just to have as a companion vampire. Like she didn't do that with Hacken. She hasn't done that with Oscar either, which is kind of interesting. Like she doesn't seem to be interested in turning people well, as well. She, yeah, I mean she she doesn't want to kill people. She no. we, we know that. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're right, she doesn't let anyone turn. Uh, is it, It's Yoka she kills in the, under the tunnel. Yeah. <clears throat> she seems so, you know, just tired with her life. And like, I, she clearly doesn't enjoy what she has to endure. And I wonder whether that plays into her motivations when having to feed, like not wanting other vampires, other people to have to go through this, like rather just kill them snap their neck so they yeah, die yeah um, and then they don't have to go through this kind of lifelong yes uh, well, i don't even know what the word is a kind of torture a, well a torture exactly again it comes back to the idea of that kind of melancholy nature of of vampires as monsters is that often you know especially since maybe you know Anne rice that the these vampires are quite broody they're quite, you know, lonely <laughs> and they're quite miserable or, or horny as well, one or the other. But sure. they're, 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 you know, they, they have a life of loneliness in the shadows, essentially, without companions or wanting companions and that kind of thing. And that's all in this, I think. Oh, for sure. Know. This film is totally about loneliness and isolation. Yeah. And yeah. that love story, that friendship is is the ultimate kind of end point. You want, you want that isolation to end. Yeah. And the only way to do that is by making a, a meaningful connection. And, and that's what, Oscar and Ellie do mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. um, yeah. yeah love it so there you go um, I was going to ask you have you seen any of the stuff that's come out subsequently <laughs> but by the sounds of it not so you've not seen the remake I've not seen no I've seen nothing I've read nothing uh, about this I mean I've got I've got a Jon Iver de Lingfist novel on my shelf not not um, not let the right one in but I so so I, I I'd like to read his stuff and I think I think one day I don't know when. Maybe now I've spoken about the film like this in such detail, mm. I can probably move on and and you know read the rest as separate things. Yeah. Um, so maybe come back to me in a year. I'll read the novel. I'll watch the the remake because it's got a great cast and a great director like Matt Reeves, Chloe Grace Moretz. It's um, yeah, yeah. Your man from Power of the Dog. Yeah, Cody Smith McPhee. Yes, and um, Richard Jenkins is the hacker oh, type character. Is he? Yeah, Brilliant. it's good. I mean, I'm sort of torn about that. Let me in from two in, from 2010, and it was it was Hammer um, that made it. It yes. was kind of part of Hammer's comeback, and I'm sort of torn about it because on the one hand, it's it's good, like it's one of the better remakes, but also it feels all the more pointless because it is essentially almost shot for shot the same as let the right one in and so i kind of just always think well what's the point there's like Mm. one or two really fun visual flourishes that matt reeves adds in there's an amazing moment where a car crash happens and the camera stays inside the car the whole time as the car sort of tumbles and it's it's it visually interesting um (laughs) but beyond that i kind of just think why not just watch the original, you know? As as, sure. as as fine as this movie is, it is it is almost exactly the same, you know? Um, so it's it's purely okay. about if you can't be asked to read subtitles, yeah. watch Let Me In, you know? Like, that's well, all it's there And for. then 
I'm not. I'm kind of intrigued about this new TV series, which I only found out about last week. Yes. With Demian Bashir, who is great. I love him. Um, but I, I don't know what they've done with the story. Mm. Is it set in America? I'm just looking it up now. So let's have a look, because I don't know anything about it either, but a couple of people have written in and said it's it's good. So uh, It's on a, Paramount Plus, I think, which yeah. I just got rid of. Um, so the premise, Mark and his daughter Eleanor's lives were changed forever 10 years earlier when she turned into a vampire. Seemingly frozen in time at the age of 12, Eleanor has lived a closed-in life, able to go out only at night, while her father does her best to provide her with the blood she needs to stay alive. Now they've oh. returned home to New York City to find a cure. Okay, so it's okay. it's a sort of like Ellie Hakan parallel by the sounds of it, but set yeah. in New York. Yeah, That's interesting because the father... I mentioned Hakan potentially being a father figure, which I wouldn't... is probably my least likely mm-hmm. scenario for Hakan. But to take that as the... Yeah, as your character, your main character in this in this adaptation is an interesting choice. New York City, though, I mean, as if we haven't seen enough New York City vampire yeah. films. <laughs> yes, that's a very um, good point. <laughs> saying yeah. that, I do like... There's a film called The Transfiguration, which I'm sure Brad will yes. mention. Yes, yes. Uh, which kind of feels a lot like a, a kind of New York City set let the right one in in many ways it is actually that's that's a really good point yeah it really is um yeah so there you go mm. so it's I mean it's clearly one of these sorts of stories though that just keeps inspiring you know more and more adaptations and all of that kind of thing which is so interesting isn't it yeah. it's just clearly struck such a chord with with audiences as it has with you you know it's such a great story for sure I mean I wonder whether Oscar will go off and try and find a cure then for Ellie. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe that's what it is. Exactly, exactly. Um, so there you go. Is there anything else that we've missed? Anything else you want to mention on Let the Right One In before we wrap up? Well, we were talking about, you know, the vampire lore and all of that. And we've ticked off. There's so much actually built into this film that mm-hmm. is classic vampire lore. Obviously, we don't get any garlic crosses or holy water. It's not really a film, a spiritual film, a religious film, is it? No, it's true. Um, yeah. You know, there's not a single mention of god or church or or anything um and we don't see many mirrors the, the shots of mirrors we get are of oscar there's some i tell you what i love Corey hedebrandt's performance as oscar so much he's brilliant really it's good really odd very but odd. then i guess that plays into this kind of someone trying to find himself understand his body at that time like we said his face is all breathing through his mouth and just yeah. odd but you see lots of shots of him in mirrors and stuff right yeah 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 um but you never see ellie you never mm-hmm. see ellie anywhere near mirrors mm-hmm. although you, i think do you see her you see her looking through a window at one point i can't remember if there's a reflection i assume not no i don't mm. remember ever seeing a reflection whereas no. the, literally the first thing you see of oscar is a reflection right when he's looking out the window that's, that's like the right first thing you yeah see in his little, a good point in his little white pants at the beginning <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. yeah it's an image you won't forget weirdly no, isn't it no um, exactly uh, and, and one of those other early scenes you know they bond over this Rubik's Cube mm-hmm. which is like the most 80s thing yes, ever of course yeah yeah, uh, yeah and you know vampires like puzzles I've, I'm, yeah. I'm led to believe anyway <laughs> they have a lot of time well, they've got a lot of time yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. although it's a bit disappointing because Ellie really does like complete it so quickly you're like mm-hmm. oh well that's, that's done you a day like yeah. we need to find you something a bit more complex don't we really um but I, I i i don't know if anyone's listened to the commentary on the blu-ray but um i can't remember if it's the director or the writer but one of them talks about how i think it's Lingfist talks about how the rubik's cube was kind of his nod towards clive barker and the lament configuration <gasps> which is fascinating because obviously hellraiser came out in the 80s then well, yeah. the, the short story did yeah um and he sees it as like, so the lament configuration is obviously a way to connect to the other side, to the Cenobites yeah. and stuff. And it, he kind of says, this is Oscar's way of connecting to the other side, to the right. to that other, which is Ellie, which is the vampire. Um, I just thought that was kind of a really interesting point that, you know, you can you could point to a cube being like a cube, but mm-hmm. there is a there is a reason behind it. I thought that was that is really interesting. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, from one horror writer to another. Uh, and yeah, I mean, there's so much in this film I love. I won't, I won't go on and on, but I do love the kind of the little moments, like the third time Ellie and Oscar meet, and you can see their relationships growing, and mm. just 
the sweetest moment where she kind of shuffles along a little bit more and smiles as like mm-hmm. we are becoming friends this is this yeah. is nice like it's a genuine kind of childish glee that they are that they're becoming friends and i love yeah. those kind of small moments yeah like and um, the other one that springs to mind is those little kids who discover discover the dead body yes um they're so cute and they're yeah. just like we need the loo and i'm like oh <laughs> over there it's just oh it's, i love it yeah, i love it, it there's is. just so much well that's what it is it's that human heart at the center of it isn't it it's like you really feel that that kind of that child glee and naivety in amongst all of this real dark stuff that's what makes mm. it work so well i think i love the moment when he puts on his record and has a little <gasps> dance as well yeah a little boogie to yeah. his, his favorite song yeah yeah, yeah. you're right oh. it's all those little moments that that make it work so well and make it so sad as well <laughs> it's like yeah. oh god yeah and it's it's almost like it's almost like ellie hasn't ever had this connection mm. or at least not for a long time because she's always kind of looking question questioningly or yeah. just there's a bit of sorrow or n- just not understanding quite what's going on uh why is he dancing like that okay i'll move a little bit yeah am i okay to do this because i probably haven't done yes. this with how can for yes god knows for quite how a long. long time exactly yeah. yeah oh it's oh it's such a beautiful film i i love it um if any, if anyone wants to um to put me up in a in a cabin in the woods just north of Stockholm during the winter at any point I'd be very happy perfect you know, preferably sure it's... preferably with a little climbing frame outside right yeah <laughs> yeah anything anything to remind me of this film um, it's, it's my dream it's my dream so there you go well Rob thank you so much well it's been so much fun discussing this film with you and just uh, remind people where they can find you and more of your stuff out there online yeah so as always I'm on social media on Instagram and Twitter at Rob Watts 88 uh, and my podcast, Kvikmindapod, that's K-V-I-K-M-Y-N-D-A-P-O-D. We discuss Icelandic cinema and we're in the middle of our fourth series, or just at the end now, actually. Um, so we can be found on any podcast platforms uh, and you can come join us on social media too. Perfect. Rob, thank you very much. Thanks again. A big thank you to the brilliant Rob Watts. Now, before we get into the second half of this week's episode to discuss Thirst, I want to take a moment to thank this week's sponsor. That is friend of the pod, writer, actor and director... Adam Robinson. Now, Adam Robinson has got a very exciting project coming up in the next few weeks that he wanted to plug, and he is also very kindly offering a special discount to Evolution of Horror listeners. So he sent me the following message. Here we go. Hello, Evolution of Horror listeners. This December, from the 7th to the 24th, I'm bringing my ghostly adaptation of A Christmas Carol to Barons Court Theatre, London, and I'm offering a discount to all Evolution of Horror listeners. It's the classic story we all know and love but our adaptation version is that bit more gothic ghostly eerie and atmospheric perfect for ghost story lovers it's a solo show so it's a really thrilling and intimate experience you're drawn right into the heart of the story and on saturday the 10th of december the evening performance that's the 7 30 p.m performance it's going to be like an eoh christmas party friends of the pod such as becky dark rob watts and of course mike himself will be coming along to see a christmas carol and there'll be drinks afterwards so come along see the show and have a christmas drink with us all i'd like to offer for a discount for EOH listeners, so please use EOH22, that's all caps, no spaces, when booking your tickets. That's EOH22. This code works on all performances, not just December the 10th. So that's 7th to the 24th of December at Barons Court Theatre in London. A huge thank you for that lovely message from my very good friend Adam Robinson. And if there's anyone out there listening who who is within reach of London and has never experienced any of Adam's brilliant plays, I can vouch for how wonderful it is to sit and get lost in his performances. And A Christmas Carol, I mean there is no better ghost story, right? Especially one to come and see in December. So please get yourself along to one of his performances. Uh, You can use the discount code EOH22 to get some money off your tickets and if you can come along to the performance on Saturday the 10th of December because as Adam said I'm going to be at that one a whole bunch of friends of the pod are going to be at that one it's going to be a really fun night we're all going to watch the performance of A Christmas Carol and then we'll all be going out for drinks in London with Adam afterwards so please do come along and join us I will list all of the details to this in the show notes 
Okay, let's move on to the second half of this week's episode. We're jumping forward one year to discuss Park Chan-wook's thirst. I sat down with friend of the pod and host of the Moving Pictures Film Club podcast, Tim Coleman, to discuss the movie. Now, Tim Coleman has been on our podcast before in our Mind and Body series discussing Asian cinema and Park Chan-wook specifically. He's a huge fan, so there was no one better I could think of to sit down and discuss all things Park Chan-wook's Thirst from 2009. <laughs> 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 Hello and welcome back, Tim Coleman. Hi, Tim. Hi, Mike Munzer. How are you, sir? <laughs> I'm very good, thanks. How are you? How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, man. I'm good. We have just had Halloween, the most beautiful time of the year. <laughs> yes. And uh, just kind of recovering from an overload of candied corn and pumpkin. So it's a good it's a good place to be. I know. November is the kind of, it's the sort of slightly calmer month in between our Christmas and actual Christmas, mm. right? That's the thing. So it's like, I'm going to try and take it easy uh, through November slightly if I can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just settle down and watch a lot of vampire movies. Actually, I've got a lot of vampire stuff to watch this this month this because um, next week I'm doing all five Twilight films, <laughs> um, and I've never seen any of them. Yeah. So I've got that. That's going to be my rest of the week, Tim. And then and then also I'm going to be covering what we do in the shadows. And I've only seen I think one season out of the four seasons of that show as well. So I've yeah. got a lot of vampire binging to do in I November, mean, basically. That's it. Yeah. That's it. I mean, it is the time of year to stay away from the sunlight to wrap up warm inside. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's right. Become a hermit for a little bit. Um, so tell me, speaking of vampire. What are your thoughts on this subgenre, Tim? Are you a fan of vampire films? So I would say I'm not not a fan. Um, it's not one of the subgenres which I would gravitate towards. So other genres which I feel more connected to, like slasher films, for example, if there's a new slasher out, that would probably be more on my radar. Um, mm. And maybe that has something to do with the fact, I guess, that a lot of us, I think, gravitate towards the films which we grew up on. And for me, vampires yeah. weren't so much part of my early cinematic diet so I, I never really grew up on like the universal draculas or the hammer horror draculas um but having said that like there is there are certain vampire films which i love um and tend to be ones maybe more like post-millennial so things like let the right one in the transfiguration mm. a girl walks home alone at night those have all been like incredible films from you know the last yeah. 15 odd years so uh yeah yeah i do like a good vampire film yeah, I think I'm very much the same. And I wonder whether that is something generational, because a few people I've spoken to have sort of said that, that it's not necessarily their favourite. And maybe you're right, like that a certain generation of us that grew up in maybe the 80s or the 90s, maybe just weren't exposed to as many vampire films, or at least like very scary mm. vampire films. You know, around the 80s and 90s, they sort of drifted out of the horror genre, I would say, you know, for a bit, I think. And then you're right, you know, some of these post-millennial films we're going to talk about bring it back to kind of creepy sort of interesting horror i think don't they which is a really yeah. nice thing to, to see yeah yeah definitely if i saw vampire films as a teen it would be things like the lost boys or fright night which yeah. are like fun good time teen movie horror like you know not teen yeah. perhaps like twilight but you know they're kind of uh very much in that kind of meta textual uh soup that you get in in the 80s mm. of like real fun popcorn movies and i think when we then compare it to stuff um, like like a lot of horror, like post nine eleven, from mid noughties onwards, got darker, got more brooding, um, and I, yeah. I think you see that reflected in a number of the films that came out. Yeah, yeah like you said, post millennial, hundred percent. What do you think it is about the vampire? You know, arguably one of the longest and most enduring popular monsters in the genre. Really, when you go back to sort of the origins of cinema itself, um, and it's still as popular today. Why do you think the vampire is such a popular monster? I mean, I guess it, it's probably partly because of, of that long-standing history that it's something which is rooted in centuries old now literature mm. um, and has captured and continue to capture imaginations in, subs in successive generations um, I also think like with the best monsters they're very malleable um, and can be applied to different contexts and, and talk about different things and so 
I know that you've covered this already on the pod, but things like the kind of rat-faced Nosferatu, who mm. um, is very disturbingly photographed in, in the aesthetic, but still has perhaps an element of he creeps into ladies' bedrooms at night to kind of penetrate them. So even from the beginning, there's, yes. the, there's the sexual connotation. Then you get into like kind of sexy hammer time, and then you, you come out the other <laughs> end into like, oh, what about like vampires to talk about childhood? Or what about vampires where we're talking about... Mm. Um, romance in a in a kind of, I mean, arguably, yeah, from Hammer movies, there's a, there's that romantic element, but like in a more like reciprocal way rather than like a domineering or invasive force. And so I think yeah, the flexibility and malleability of of this monster as metaphor probably helps ensure its longevity. Hundred percent agree with you. Yeah, um, and I think it it. I wonder whether we're on, we're on the cusp of another vampire renaissance. You know, we had Bid- Midnight Mass, which was such mm-hmm. a hit last year. We've got a brand new Salem's Lot coming mm-hmm. next year as well. I wonder if this monster is going to slowly creep back into sort of popularity again, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, one thing I know that Kev Lyons said on the pod about the uh, the class element of uh, Count Dracula, mm. you know, that this is a member of the aristocracy who literally drains the the blood of the peasants from the village dry. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. like, it, we're not going to like lose any uh, <laughs> listeners here, but <laughs> it feels like that's a very thinly veiled applicable metaphor to talk about. The, even just like the last six weeks in the UK, we've had this like in, yeah. insane financial decisions being made by our government, which is kind of basically shipwrecked the economy in in a matter of weeks. And mm. um, there there is a kind of age old element of like the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. And 100%. vampires, I think, are the monsters to to talk about that. 100%. Well, there we go. Well, let's get into this week's film then, um, which is Thirst from 2009 by the by the great Park Chan-wook. So, uh, Tim, set us up. Uh, first of all, what's the story of Thirst? So Thirst follows um, a Catholic priest called Father Sang Hyung, played by Song Kang-ho, um, who gives himself over for a medical trial and becomes essentially infected with a virus which turns him into a bloodthirsty vampire. And Thirst then follows his battles, both spiritually and physically, to kind of wrestle with his appetites and also his blossoming sexual desire for the wife of a friend of his, Taiju, played by Kim Ok-bin. Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed. Um, wow, what a film, right? Uh, it it really goes places as well you know it's quite long uh, and it kind of it very much kind of finishes in a different place to where it starts I think this movie is so interesting what what do you think of it what's your history with this movie and, and what are your thoughts on it generally so I mean Park Chanuk is my favourite director so I don't think director Park makes bad films I've I've, uh-huh. n- I've not seen a bad film that he's made um, and yeah I mean for Thirst I would say with that in mind so I am a fan but I would still say it's maybe second tier director park for me yeah um so for me like the films that he made from 2000 so we're talking joint security area sympathy for mr vengeance old boy lady vengeance and i'm a cyborg but that's okay for me those five films are just chef's kiss i think they're absolutely perfect and then thirst is the first film we get after that which i don't think is perfect but i think continues to be incredibly interesting compelling and much like those previous five films invites the audience into uh, like a really liminal space where you're asked to hold a bunch of competing ideas and competing feelings and it doesn't offer any easy explanations or easy readings to it. And um, I mean, that's why he's my favourite director is is the ability to hold ambiguity and invite us into that space. Um, but yeah, in terms of my history, I actually saw this because of you, Mike, because uh, mm. we were on the Mind and Body series a few years ago doing Old Boy. And I kind of at that point was like, oh, I'm going to watch everything by Director Park that I've not seen and watch Thirst right. at that point. So, yeah, I, I have to dip my, my vampire cap towards you. I love it. Yeah, I, I very much agree with you. In fact, originally, I was a little bit down on this film. I haven't seen it since it first came out. I watched it back in 2009. I remember very clearly me and my friends who were obsessed with Park Chan-wook, you mm. know, as so many of us were with Asian cinema during that decade. And, you know, old boy... Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance. These were some of my favourite movies ever. So we rushed at the chance to get the DVD of Thirst when it came out and Mm. watched it. And I remember being quite disappointed for whatever reason. I don't know why. I I don't know whether it just maybe it's the vampire thing that I just wasn't that keen on in my horror tastes at the Mm -hmm. time. It wasn't quite as 
as I don't know as transgressive maybe as something mm-hmm. like old boy um, and I remember feeling like it was a little bit disappointing a little bit bottom, a bit, a bit lower tier Park Chan work and I haven't been back to it since and actually I wasn't even going to include it on this vampire series initially until so many listeners got in touch and mm-hmm. were like you have to include this film it's wonderful yeah. and so I was like right I need to give it a second chance and 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 throw it in the mix and actually I'm so glad I did because I don't know what was wrong with me the first time I watched it. I absolutely loved revisiting this movie yeah. last night. Um, it is, you know, like you say, director Park is phenomenal. Every film he does is is masterful in some way or another. So I don't mean it in a bad way to say that, yes, I agree with you. It is sl- middle tier Park Chan Wook, I would say. Yeah. It's not up there with the best of his work, but it's still just stunning isn't it it's beautiful to look at it's weird it's erotic it's gross Mm. it's all the things that you want from a great Park Chan-wook movie I think isn't it and it does some really interesting things with vampirism too you know yeah Yeah. no definitely and I think it does come at that kind of transitional stage between the perhaps Park the provocateur from the that early noughties part of his career to maybe yeah Park the more and I use this term lightly but prestige filmmaker that we then have um, in the 2010s and obviously with films like The Handmaiden and this year's decision to leave um, he's in a different phase of his career and I think partly like um, director Park talks about collaborating with uh, his screenwriter who he still works with now uh, Se Kyung Jung who uh, he started working with on I'm a Cyborg but that's okay mm. which again that film which I love is a very different tone to the Vengeance trilogy before it's a kind of a romantic comedy one flew over the cuckoo's nest film about badness and connection. Um, it's and, but FYI, that is a wonderful. Oh, film. so good! And I feel like so it's good. probably his his least seen movie. But if there is anyone out there that hasn't seen I'm a Cyborg, but it's okay, it's wonderful, isn't it? So Absolutely good, wonderful. so good. Yeah. I think if you're a fan of uh, Amelie, for me, it gives me big Amelie vibes in the in yes. the tone and the whimsy to it. And and his films have always had the that kind of whimsical comedic tone, and we'll probably come on to some of that when we're talking about Thirst. Uh, but yeah, that was his first um, film collaborating. No, sorry, his second film collaborating with uh, Seo Kyung Jung. So he also worked with her on Lady Vengeance, and, and I think you can kind of then trace that um, that influence of collaborating with her as, as his writer has helped. Well, he uses this himself, helps him expand his framework to considering female perspectives and female voices, mm. um, which I love. Because I think if you look at, though, like JSA is a quite a masculine film, Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance and Old Boy both are, certainly. Um, and then Lady Vengeance onwards, he's a, he's a more perhaps balanced and nuanced uh, filmmaker in terms of tackling uh, the relationship between men and women and having more well-rounded female characters. Um, so, yeah, apparently... Uh, Bong Joon-ho, who's a good friend of director Park, says that those three films, Lady Vengeance, um, I'm a Cyborg, and Thirst, are the Seo Kyung Jung trilogy of Park's filmography. That's <clears throat> that's really fascinating. I, ne- I never really thought about it in that way, but you're so right. There is something <clears throat> very... Um, sort of male about some of those early movies and we probably talked about that with old boy you know Mm. um but uh you're right you know like these these later movies even moving into of course the handmaiden right these these movies but thirst included and stoker too these films about kind of very much female desire and that kind of thing and one of the things that i do really appreciate uh about Park chan work you know this is something that i see a lot of people sort of talking about and writing about at the moment is that are movies becoming slightly more conservative with a lowercase c? It's slightly more uh, sexless, mm. I suppose, right? And I think that Park Chan-wook is still one of the few filmmakers that kind of embraces sex as a positive in a lot of his films. You know, again, going back to things like The Handmaiden, but also moments in this as well. Like, there is such joy and sensuality mm. in his films, you know, which I really appreciate, as well as everything else that he does so masterfully. You know? Yeah, definitely. And I think when, you, you know, you can watch interviews with director Park talking about how he tried to collaborate with Kim Ok Bin, who plays Taiju in the movie, about yeah. some of the sex scenes, and just him being very cognizant of not wanting to, to be an exploitative film. So although, for example, I think Thirst is a very sexy film, a very horny film, like a lot of vampire films mm. are, it doesn't. It never feels cheap or exploitative. It just feels like it's actually engaging with the issues of sensuality and sexuality. Um, yeah. And director Park talks about how he wouldn't let uh, Kim Ok Bin even sign the contract until he'd gone through all the storyboards, and so she had complete control and consent over what was being filmed, which... Yeah. That's amazing. It just like hats off to him. Hats, hats off to him. That's really, really good. And of course, this is very much a kind of a story of a of, of a couple here and, and, and our Catholic priest, obviously, um, 
is is arguably the protagonist, but also it feels so much like it's actually Taiju's movie mm. and her story, you know, yeah, so yeah. much. And and I love that they they really are given kind of equal amounts fun and great stuff to do in this film. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, what do you think generally of the direction in this movie then? You know, I do think we, you know, speaking of decision to leave, what a stunning film, um, as, you know, and, and, and has this movie got that kind of classic Park Chan-wook eye, the cinematography, that, that, you know, beautiful visual style that we've come to kind of associate with him, would you say? Um, I would say it does, though perhaps on a slightly more um, controlled or muted palette than perhaps some mm. of the previous films. So I think one of the things which makes films like Old Boy so immediately arresting is the hyperkinetic control of the frame, the transitions, the the way the camera moves. We of course have the incredible corridor fight and a number of those early films have those big set pieces. Now, I feel like Thirst does have those moments and we'll, we'll probably come to them in a moment like the uh the rooftop jumping scene yeah. uh, for example, um and certain images where um, uh, father uh, Sang Hun is, is putting Teju into his shoes. These kind of very beautiful images, but I would say overall it's less perhaps aggressively um, stylish than some of the, some of the mm. other work. So yeah, very very beautiful. Um, and of course, director Park studied aesthetics at university, so I don't think he could make a film that wasn't beautiful. I think everything <laughs> everything he uh, does is gorgeous to look at. But perhaps this is a slightly more controlled or downplayed. Uh, version of of his his style. Yeah, you're right. You know, there are these beautiful set pieces that are often take place outside, but so much of it is within the confines of this small sort of apartment, isn't it? Yes. People being shut in rooms and that kind of thing. So there is less chance maybe of that kind of visual flourish in those kind of situations. But, yeah. but um, it's still very striking to look at, I think. I think know? so. Yeah. And, and there is still these moments. I think one early scene is where um, Father Sang Hun is playing on his flute and he has mm. been infected with this vampire virus and starts to vomit blood and it gushes down the flute and it erupts out of the, the blowholes. Yeah. Incredible image, just yeah. beautiful and disgusting, which is, I don't know, that's what I want from my genre films. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's so gross. Yeah. Uh, yes. And the, even something in the costuming and the way these actors and characters look, you know, like there's something, Mrs. Ra, the the, the, the sort of overly protective mother, right, um, mm. is is such a brilliant character quite big quite outlandish but also so striking and so interesting and it's such a it's such a brilliant performance i think even in the second half of the film where she's not really doing a whole lot yeah but just her presence there in the room throughout you know i think he does some really fun things with his characters and costuming and blocking and that kind of thing you know yeah absolutely yeah i mean we probably should say at this point that thirst in terms of its the basic beats of its plot is based on a 19th century French novel uh, called yeah. uh, Therese Racan by Emile Zola. Um, and so this was, I think, Zola's third novel, and it was the one that really uh, made him famous and um, was decried when it first came out, Mike, as being putrid, which again, yes! that's, that's the kind of uh, words that I like to have to <laughs> describe my art. <laughs> um, well, I know, let me tell you, I studied uh, Therese Racan at, at okay, university cool. when I did theatre, and uh, also, I've seen a couple of stage productions of it. Weirdly, I never made the association in my head until reading about Thirst afterwards that, of course, it's the same. It is the same story as 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 Therese Rakan, but um, and everything that happens to the mother in the second half is exactly what happens uh, to the mother absolutely. in Therese Rakan. But I just did not put those two and two together. Yeah, yeah but yeah, so yeah. I mean, I think I mean that's com- I think completely understandable because the big difference is there are no vampires in Therese Rakan. No, so- <laughs> no, there is that. There is that one difference. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting that like you said that there. Are- there are certain other story beats which are the same, like Therese Rakan is about um, a woman who's married to this kind of sickly, waif-like man who doesn't satisfy her, and he she lives with him and his mother, her aunt, um, mm. and then she falls in love with a friend of her husband who's this very suave and sexy guy, and they, cons- they could start an adulterous relationship and they conspire to murder the husband and then start their life together but of course as often is the way the the murder is just the beginning of their problems and their their relationship collapses under the weight of their cumulative guilt and yeah yeah and so if you kind of look at that as a headline well that is the trajectory of thirst um and they it, both the novel and this film end in a very similar place with how th- the characters meet their meet their ends so yeah um yeah, yeah so Teresa can but it's... with fangs you know 
I love it. I love it. And there was a very, one of the most iconic moments of the play of Therese Rakan it is the moment when the sort of catatonic mother starts to kind of spell out in words what happened, right? And that this murder happened. And of course, that is kind of reflected in this when they're playing that game. What is that game they're playing, by the way? It's kind of like Scrabble meets poker or something. But, I think it uh, is it yeah. Mayong? Mayong, that's it. That's uh, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think, I mean, he's always had quite a literary sensibility. Like Old Boy, of course, is based on a book, albeit a, a graphic novel. Yeah. Um, and he'd go back to things like, uh, well, I mean, we have Stoker after this. And I mm. I mean, that's a whole other conversation. But of, of course, it makes the, the name kind of evokes vampirism, at least. It um, does. And yeah, then we have yeah. The Handmaiden, which is based on Fingersmith. So he, he's he's got this kind of this uh, trajectory of adapting literary works, um, be they novels or graphic novels or, or whatever, and then like transposing the ideas and the bones of the ideas into a different form, which which I love. Yeah, I love it. And I suppose he even does that with films too. I mean, Stoker is uh, Shadow of a Doubt, Hitchcock's Shadow of a Doubt, mm. right, as well. And he's yeah, taking yeah. these other sources and doing his own thing with them. Um, yeah, really, really wonderful. So what do you think of our sort of, I mean... Th- the the kind of portrayal of vampirism i suppose mm. you know we've seen so many different types of vampires and different portrayals of vampires throughout this series what do you think of of the way the vampires are kind of um, realized on screen in this movie yeah i mean i i love it and um i think this feels like very much like a post 28 days later uh, yes. vampire film because it's viral it's right viral, yeah. yeah it's in the, yeah. it's in the blood and so um yeah i mean when we first meet uh sang hyun he's working as a catholic priest in a hospital um, and it feels like a very dissatisfied individual. Um, he's mm. kind of wrestling with questions of his faith um, and just seems like just very low. And there's a recurring motif in the film about is there a difference between suicide and martyrdom? And he essentially volunteers to go to a experimental clinic overseas where he will be a guinea pig for a vaccine against something called, I think it's the Emmanuel virus, um, mm. uh, which is like leprosy, but only affects men. And he, there's this question of, well, is this su- simply suicide? Is he just wants to die? Um, or is it actually he does want to die, but he wants to die for the greater good, so as to give his life meaning? And that that is an idea that continues throughout the film. Um, But yeah, so he does become infected and then this virus essentially gives him a thirst for blood. He kind of gets these leprous sores on his face and although he miraculously survives the virus on its first first wave he these sores keep returning unless he can drink the blood of other human beings and so it kind of mm. sets him on this trajectory then of trying to source blood from people in comas because he, he being a good catholic doesn't want to outright murder someone at this point although that changes, <laughs> that changes. yeah it's really interesting how you know th- there is always this this um tension in throughout vampire movies of are you the same person when you transform into a vampire or is mm. it like a monster takes over your body? And and he seems like he's very much still the same guy, yeah. right? With just, just with this thirst, but he's still trying to do what he did. He's still trying to be a Catholic priest. He's still trying to help people. He just has to do what he has to do to survive, yeah. right? And uh, But then on the other side of that, Teju is she does seem to sort of transform a bit when she becomes mm. a vampire, right? Or maybe that kind of side of her was always there, which yes. we can talk about. But but uh, I, I think all that's really fascinating. And I think the, the vampirism, like you say, treated more like a kind of viral infection. And there are a few kind of classic vampire tropes that we have here. Obviously, sunlight kills <laughs> them. Um, but we don't necessarily... There, there is less of that kind of religious supernatural stuff. We don't know if they're... It doesn't seem like they're affected by crucifixes, for example, or no. holy water, or, you know, a wooden stake through the heart, maybe, or whatever, you know? Like, there's there's less of that. And like you say, it's taken more of a 28 days later, a kind of viral yeah. kind of stance, hasn't it? Yeah. I, I think if crucifixes affected him, it would have made his remaining career as a Catholic <laughs> priest very short-lived. But, uh... Very different. <laughs> exactly. But they do also have this kind of super strength, right? I mean, yeah. they, these amazing... They don't quite fly but they can kind of leap right and mm. i love like those brilliant jumping scenes uh, yeah really really wonderful you know but i guess yeah. that's almost just like again coming back to that kind of sci-fi element almost a bit like brundle in the fly initially before things start to go badly for him he mm. becomes a bit more virile and a bit more uh strong and that kind yeah, of yeah 100 percent. yeah i mean there's a scenes early on where he can start 
hearing things which are not in his flat like he can hear the world outside of his flat um yeah he doesn't need glasses anymore his sexual appetites increase in which kind of leads to him um hooking up with taiju um but yeah i, I think the character of uh sang Hyun does remain the same and like director park mm. talks about how he was interested in a character who didn't change at all. Like a lot of characters go through growth and change across the, across the course yeah. of a narrative. But he wanted to tell a story where a guy uh, doesn't change. And um, although, of course, physically he does with his appetites, but as a character, his, his mm. values remain the same. And uh, Director Park describes him as being a pious man at the beginning and a pious man at the end, um, yeah. which I think is really interesting. You know, I mean, the, I think certainly C makes some very morally dubious decisions throughout the film, but like, certainly um, I guess we'll come to this in due course but the, the last act to me shows a guy who is still in his own broken way trying to maintain his own code um, yes and yes. yeah I find that I think that's really interesting certainly when as you say you kind of contrast that with the more animalistic appetites of Taiju absolutely and and you're right everything he does you know some of his actions are of course not great but everything he does he justifies to himself as being for the for the greater good right even by killing the husband and he's doing that because he thinks he's an abusive husband, right? Yes. That's the thing, and, and for all these other reasons. Um, let's talk about Taiju then. What a fascinating character she is. A, a, a sad backstory, I think, mm-hmm. to this character. But then she, she what a trans, in, in comparison, right, to our priest, what a transformation she goes on from the first time we see her at the beginning of the film to the end of the film, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think she is more of what we might think of as a typical or classical vampire, somebody who is liberated by the experience of becoming a vampire. So she goes from being this clearly very put upon and trapped woman who's stuck in this loveless marriage with this guy who's um, just like a big man baby, essentially. Yes, and um, and the I mean she doesn't become a vampire straight away. It's it's something which comes maybe about an hour in I think, uh, where she initially begins this adulterous relationship with Sang Hyun. She realizes he's a vampire, um, and then she essentially lies to him that uh, her husband is beating her because she has some injuries on her legs, which in reality she caused herself. So Sang Hyun is kind of essentially tricked into murdering. Um, Kang Wu, which again, we'll maybe come back to that in a moment because that sequence is incredible. But then mm-hmm. after she becomes a vampire, mm-hmm. um, yeah, like the gloves are off. It's like she she talks explicitly about how she doesn't want to just steal from blood banks the way that Sang Hyun is doing. She wants the thrill of the hunt. She yeah, uh, and in a way which maybe even prefigures uh, Raw. There's there's a sequence where she kind of drives a car off the road, like causes a causes somebody to crash so she can eat the uh, the motorist. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. And that really sets their characters on a collision course because she is a amoral or so somebody who mm-hmm. feels like feel like she is an animal above humans now that so there is not a morality between humans like one. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, while Sang Hyun is far more like this is wrong we can't do this. Yeah. But it's a fascinating thing because she at the same time yes she is she does become more overtly monstrous but you're there is something there is something of a kind of good for her element about yeah. it too yeah, yeah. right because she because of the the horrible shit that she's been through you know uh, in her life where she was what abandoned by her parents at like three years old yep. sort of adopted by this woman who didn't really treat her very well yep. who married her off to her son essentially yep. uh, and the two of them kind of completely could sort of have complete control over her life yep. um and she is miserable like she's been she, she, she's she's been miserable her entire life and yeah like you said that kind of that idea that is so popular throughout the subgenre that vampirism means freedom means yeah. liberation from uh, especially for women uh, yes. you know it means no longer having to be uh, restricted to those kind of societal uh, you know rules uh, mm-hmm. that that, are, that they're put upon you know so yeah all of that is is kind of really fascinating isn't it and i think there is such an emotional heart to this film that mm. even though yeah she's doing <laughs> pretty bad things at the end there's still something so sad about that final act when she's desperately trying to survive yes you know just before the sun comes up you know yeah no 100 percent. i guess that that's, goes back to the ambiguity that we kind of talked about earlier where yeah uh director park doesn't pass judgment on any of his characters i don't think he just kind of presents them um and says yeah these are all people with their own histories um and their own internal logics and reasons for why they act and I'm just asking you to enter into an empathic space with them and see yeah. how the story unfolds, 
which I love. There's the remakes that there's not a right or wrong reading of this film. It's just asking you to kind of understand and not shy away from the fallout of those decisions either. Because mm-hmm. as, as a matter of Patriot as Taiju Zark is, she still leaves a lot of bodies in her wake. So She does. She <laughs> certainly know. does. And what about arguably maybe the most sort of cartoonish character in this is Kang Wu, right? The, yeah. uh, the husband, the sickly husband who after he is murdered, continues to come back in these kind of brilliantly weird, creepy yeah. visions. So grotesque, right? Always kind of dripping with sweat or snot or water or something. Like, he is such a wet person. Literally. Quite literally in this yeah. film, isn't he? What What do you think of him? Yeah, it was a great performance by uh, Shin Hakun. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. And, of course, he's wet as well because they kill him by drowning him. Um, yes. So, yeah, in Therese Rakan, um, uh that character called Camille is drowned in the Seine in Paris. Uh, here right, he's yeah. drowned in a uh, reservoir, I think, where they're going fishing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, it's fantastic. Because he is so grotesque and he's just, just really... Yeah, just really not just unlikable, but so pathetic in like a, in a true sense um, yes, uh, yes. that you completely empathise. Certainly at the beginning, with why Taiju feels so utterly destroyed by the captivity she's, she's held in in this oppressive relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, I think mm. f- those moments where he comes back for me, I guess, is where I would say it works slightly less well because in in the novel, the uh, they the murderers have these kind of flashbacks of the body of of their victim returning returning, and that's like haunting their consciences I think because here we're already in the world of supernaturalism like we're already asked to believe in vampires it's less shocking and we're also less clear if it's real or not that when he's because I I remember the first time I saw Thirst and um, uh, San Kyun says he kind of put him at the bottom of the reservoir with a rock on his chest to keep him down there and my thought was, oh, so he's turned into a vampire, but he's keeping him trapped at the bottom of the reservoir. But right, but right. no, I don't so think that could it. literally come back. Yeah, potentially. yeah, but yeah. I think it's, yeah. I think it's more symbolic, as in like I've killed him, he's down there, and I'm just worried he's going to come back. And so for me, like that works slightly less well in the translation. But nevertheless, it is again visually striking. My, one of my favourite shots in the film is where they are desperately trying to drown their sorrow in sex, but. <laughs> but Kangaroo's <laughs> moist corpse is lying between them. So, like, Sang Hyun is just yeah. like humping away at this cadaver, <laughs> trying to get to his lover. And it's like, it's gross, but funny, but sad. And that's all in one shot, you know? Absolutely. I completely agree with you. Let's talk about the grossness of this film as well, because I also think, you know, as beautiful and sensual as Park Chan Wook's films are, he can also really he can really gross me out with some body horror and gore you know in his movies even old boy i'm thinking of like the teeth being Mm, pulled out and that kind of thing right um what do you think of the horror i suppose itself in this movie and the way it's realized on screen yeah i mean i I do think it is slightly downplayed like if if people come to this expecting it to be as explicit as something like the vengeance trilogy like particularly like lady vengeance which ends with a 30 minute torture scene or however long that goes yes. on for yes. um, it's, it's not that but there are these moments uh, which which are shocking such as we mentioned the vomiting blood down the flute um, mm. and um, there is some sequences at the end where uh, Taiju and Sang Hyun they've kind of painted their flat white um, to kind of yes. like give the illusion of it being daylight but then when Taiju is unwell she's vomiting blood everywhere and um, there's some uh, some gnarly bits which are a bit more like low key, where Sang Kyung is trying to source blood in an ethical way, and he goes back to his bishop who slits his wrist to let him suckle on his wrist. Yeah, uh, and it, uh, that's like a maybe a smaller moment, but because it's more relatable, <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. I can imagine that it, you know if someone vomiting blood is, is so outlandish, I kind of would struggle to empathise with how that feels. But the idea of like a small cut makes me feel yes. a bit funny, you know. <laughs> Well, there, and that's right. And there's some moments that are more suggestive. Like I was watching it with my wife and she had to look away at the moment when the, uh, Teju is is imagining stabbing mm. her husband in the mouth with a pair of pliers, right? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, she doesn't do it. But because it's Park Chan-wook, 
you do feel a bit like that could happen at any moment, Absolutely. right? And the way that the camera follows back and forth, back and forth, her kind of, um, you know, enacting this kind of stabbing right in the teeth almost. It's there's something really kind of uh, about it. Yeah, you know? totally. It's, it's the anticipation, isn't it? it and yeah. It is. Yeah, fantastic. Um, what do you think of that central romance between uh, Sanghyun and Taeju? Do you actually, do you sort of buy into the central romance of the story? So I, I buy into the animalistic love which kind of starts their starts their mm. romance because um like even i think it might even be before he's infected um when we meet kind of sang sang Hyun and he's kind of in this um he's experiencing ennui almost this kind of dis disaffection with his life um and he is like uh beating his thigh with i think like a cane or something uh, presumably yeah. to kind of stop him feeling any kind of sexual desire um and mm -hmm. so when he's then infected with the virus and he starts this relationship with taiju it's all pours out like it is passionate and it's risky mm -hmm. and it's dangerous and having sex in hospital beds with people that could walk in and yeah. it, it's so I, I believe in that because it makes it makes complete sense but what it feels to me like as it kind of ex goes on is that this was never a relationship that was entered into level-headedly where they considered how well matched they were um and it just essentially becomes incredibly toxic where they just are very quickly on divergent paths where they they see the world differently in terms of should you eat people or not that's a, yes. always <laughs> always a classic argument with couples um, <laughs> and yeah and then they they end up essentially hating each other um so yeah i think for me it's less of a romance more of a like a fallout of people who should probably have never got together in the first first place. They're just not suited to each other. Yeah, absolutely. Two very different people come from from different backgrounds. I think, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And what do you think of the way in which this all comes to a head in the in the final act? You know, that, that's one of the moments that really stayed with me from when I first watched it in two thousand nine. Is that quite prolonged sunrise sequence on the cliff at the mm. end which i think is and it's almost completely silent right mm -hmm. and it's funny as well and it's almost slapstick it's almost like yeah. you're watching a kind of looney tunes cartoon or something on top of a cliff but but it works so well for me what do you think of that kind of final sequence yeah and it's beautiful i think again it's emblematic of the things which make director park such a compelling director is his mastery mm. of tone and his subversion of tone you know um i know that uh, when Park talks about like what genre are his films, he says mm. that he, um, when he's making films, he doesn't really try and set genres and then conform to them. He just kind of tells his stories um, and then kind of reflects afterwards that maybe they all end up being kind of thrillers because you know he's a big fan of Hitchcock. We mentioned like the Hitchcock influence on Stoker a moment ago. Um, and I think that just kind of liberates him to kind of dip in and out of different genres at different times. So yes, ostensibly you could say this is a horror film because it's got vampires in it, but it is also a romance. It's also a relationship drama. It's also a mm -hmm. murder film noir, a thriller, a comedy. Those leaping from rooftop to rooftop scenes arguably are indebted to Waxia movies, um, you know, like magical yeah. martial arts heroes. And he, I just yeah, think there's, he, there's even something of Margot Kidder in Superman when he's flying, yeah. right? You know, like there's even something of that in that moment. But yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think that that's one of the things that makes him such a vital feel, filmmaker, and you know, more broadly, Korean cinema as well. Like we should say, um, Taiju, um, the actress who plays Taiju, Kim Ok Bin, was the headline uh, character in The Villainess from a few years ago, which is an incredible yeah. Korean film as well that messes with genre. Um, but yeah, to go back to your original question about the, the final moments, I think that's a, that's a great emblematic example of how different different tones are in play. So ostensibly at this point, um, Sankyon has kind of, I think, resolved that they cannot continue as they have been. Um, mm -hmm. they, there's been a massacre at that family home, essentially, where Taiju has basically killed and eaten numerous of their friends. Um, yes. <laughs> and uh, we, they kind of get in the car to kind of go away, and they think that they're kind of fleeing the scene of a crime, or certainly that Taiju does, but we realise, actually, San Kyun is kind of setting up something. So mm -hmm. there's a reveal that the girl that we thought he'd killed in the massacre was not killed, so he pretended to kill her so that she could escape. He then goes to um, a campsite of uh, people who are staked out, I think out of sight of his seminary or his hospital, like because he's basically become a Catholic saint by this point because he recovered from the, the virus. And so there they're kind of asking him to heal them. And he goes there and uh, 
pretends to rape somebody. Basically, I don't. I, my reading of that scene, he's basically discovered on top of a crying woman with his trousers down. And my reading is not that he was actually trying to rape her, but he was trying to disabuse these people of their deification of him to kind of show them that he is just a man. Stop worshiping yes. me, go away. Um, yes. And interestingly, that's the first time apparently in Korean cinema that full frontal male nudity was ever on screen. So I read that too. I know. There you go. I know. There you go. It's an important film in that regard. There we go. Yeah, and I think that's a really good, interesting reading because I was going to ask you about that scene. That's the one moment that sort of confused me when we suddenly yeah. cut to that moment of him sexually assaulting a woman in, in in the tent but you're right you know that does make perfect sense he's removing this kind of deity view, view of him almost isn't he I think yeah, yeah totally I mean my yeah. first viewing I was like what is he doing like like why And but yeah I think it is there's like a little smile on his face as he walks away and yeah like when he gets off it he's not even he's not hard as well so uh, no. there's, there's a sense of him he was there to basically destroy his own reputation um, purposely so I think um, which reframes it because obviously it's not making that what he did okay in any sense, but it, it maybe reframes his his values and his decision making process that got him to that point. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, and then we get to the scene on the cliff where he has driven Mrs. Ra, who is the the father of Kangwu, so father the the mother of Kangwu, um, and Taiju, and they go up to the cliff just before sunrise, and Taiju realizes to her horror that he has brought them both there to die and to be burnt by the sun. And yeah, there's a protracted sequence where she's trying to hide and he is taking away all of her hiding places. Like she climbs into the boot, he rips the boot lid off. She pulls the boot lid back on herself. He throws <laughs> it in the sea. She uh, hides under the tra- under the uh, the car. He pushes yeah. the car off of her. And in the end, she just is resigned and they sit on the hood of the car together and are gradually burnt to a cinder as the as the uh, the sun comes up. And Mrs. Rara sitting in the back seat watching the murderer's first son turn to ash. So, yeah. yeah, it's very, very sad. And again, like very, you could argue, you could, depending on what you're reading as of the characters, kind of ambiguous how you should feel. Like, is Sang Hyun saving people uh, from yeah. the, the barbarism of tai, Taiju? Yes, he is. But he's also making that decision for her. So he, he is murdering her still. Like, he is, yeah. it's a murder-suicide, essentially, at the end. So, uh, yeah, but... And facet and beautiful, right? As beautiful, well, that yeah. moment when he kind of they're looking out to the horizon and it all turns red as they start to burn up and everything yeah. as well. I think the visuals in that in that moment are wonderful. They yeah. do, and they go down in holding each other as well. So, like, there is that moment of this doomed romance has literally burnt burnt them both to a crisp. Yes. At the end. And that sweet moment as well, where she puts on his shoes, you know, as they uh, just before they're about to die, yes. and you're just reminded of way back when they first met, you know. And uh, yeah, there's something very, very sweet and moving about it, despite all of the other fucked upness of this movie. I suppose, you know, it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, it is wonderful. Yeah. And like, I mean, yeah, for me, that that is that's the life of of his films is is yeah. not giving easy, re- easy readings, not saying like, okay, maybe this relationship was toxic. But it's not without its beautiful moments still. And, yes. and that, 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 that is life, you know. Nothing really, or very few things in life, are fully good or fully bad. So there are all these kind of mixtures of, of beautiful moments and horrible moments. You know? Absolutely true. Um, so there you go. How, how Finally, how do you think this film holds up then? You know, it's not, it's not particularly that old, of course, but um, re-watching it again, did you find that it kind of held up well? Yeah, for me, it improved on, uh, on repeat viewing because... Um, yeah, some of those because there is such ambiguity and uh, like you know, lack of hand holding in walking you through the story. Um, I think you always get more things by going back to Parks movies, and uh, I think this one is no different. It, it's beautiful and frustrating and gross and sexy and funny mm. and yeah, it's a it's a shot in the arm really, which is what I keep coming to cinema for at least I completely agree with you um, it went up massively in my estimation giving it a second watch um, and now I yeah I, I would I would rank it up there you know not as high as some of his absolute best or some of my absolute favourites but it's it's what a wonderful vampire film just in general right yeah. really really wonderful yeah um, so there you go and for my final question for you then Tim speaking of vampires before you go is what is your favourite vampire film oh amazing um Oh, okay. Can I have a? Can I have two? Is that two? Of course. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go for A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night, uh, which I think yes. is a film that on paper shouldn't work. A black and white Iranian skateboarding vampire 80s set <laughs> disco western, but it's incredible. And then Fright Night because good times, good times. Oh, and Brewster, you're so cool. 
<laughs> so cool what a great uh pairing to kind of show the scope of the of vampire movies as well yeah, yeah absolutely. lovely lovely well tim thank you so much it's been such a joy having you back on the podcast um and before you go just remind people where they can find you and more of your work and your podcast and everything else out there yeah thanks man so i'm on twitter although i guess with elon musk buying it who knows how long (laughs) yes i know um but yeah at the moment on there at fats coleman f-a-t-s-c-o-l-e-m-a-n and i have um, a podcast as well called uh, moving pictures film club so that's on twitter at moving pics club or you can download that wherever you get your podcasts from Amazing. Tim, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, mate. And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening and a huge thank you to this week's guests, Tim Coleman and Rob Watts. So I would love to hear your thoughts on these two movies. Please do get in touch. You can email us evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can also find us on all the socials, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd. If you want to discuss this week's episode with fellow listeners, you can join our Discord, the Evolution of Horror Discord, or you can join our discussion group. That's the Evolution of Horror discussion group, which you can find on Facebook. If you want to support this podcast financially and get treated to regular bonus episodes, then you simply need to sign up to our Patreon, patreon.com slash evolution of horror. If you want to support this podcast but can't afford to do so financially, we'd be so grateful if you could drop us a little rating or review on Apple Podcasts or whichever podcast app you use. It's completely free, it only takes you 30 seconds, and it's a massive help in getting us discovered by new listeners. So, on to next week's episode then, and next week is going to be a very fun discussion. Now, this might be a bit of a controversial choice. I've already had a few listeners express their disdain in uh, in us covering this particular series of films next week, but actually, I can think of no more important vampire movie franchises that really changed the game and changed the face of vampire movies in the 21st century than this one. So next week, I'm going to be joined by Steph McKenna, and we are going to be discussing all five Twilight movies. That's Twilight from 2008 all the way through to Breaking Dawn Part 2 in 2012. (sighs) Good luck, everybody. Join us next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror. Horror.